Hello, I'm Ian, and I'm the Director of Operations at Penland. And I want to share a recent project I worked on called Liminal. This is the Center for Craft in downtown Asheville, and they asked me to create a design feature on the surface of this part of the building. I was on their radar because most of my art practice for the last seven or eight years has been making tiles. These are high relief tiles made out of concrete. To explore tiles is really to explore the world of tessellations, which are any shapes that fit together without any gaps or overlaps. When most people think of tessellations, they think of MC Escher. Escher's work is amazing, and as a younger person, I spent a lot of time looking at these. But the real masters of tessellation have always been the designers and builders of the Middle East. For most of the works like this one, the geometric patterning is an act of devotion, a tribute to a sense of divine order. But no matter what the context, I think that patterns touch on something eternal, something in a very deep part of us. We are constantly trying to fix an understandable pattern onto the information that our senses give us. And that's why patterns can be so evocative and delightful, because they light up some of our deepest cognitive architecture. I've mostly designed tessellations using multiple shapes, like these tiles that will be going into the new courthouse at Penland. But in a way, these are easier than finding a single shape that can tessellate while still being interesting and dynamic to the viewer. In looking for individual shapes that tessellate, you'll find that all triangles or three-sided forms will. All four-sided forms will tessellate. And many six-sided forms will tessellate. So three, four, and six-sided polygons are pretty straightforward. The pentagon, though, not so much. Obviously, a regular pentagon won't tessellate. And when you do find a five-sided form to fit together, the results are pretty fantastic, weird and dynamic, and just a lot of fun to look at. In the history of mathematics, only 15 different types of pentagons have been identified that can tessellate with themselves. Four of these were discovered in the 70s by an amateur mathematician named Marjorie Rice, who I could easily devote a whole slideshow to. She was a mother of five with no formal education past high school, and she was in her 50s before she started working on the problem. This is one of the tessellations she discovered, which provides the basic architecture for the design of liminal. I also used this form to do this project, Posos Profundos, which was installed in a high school in central Mexico and made in collaboration with the students there. For liminal, I took the basic pentagonal form on the left, and then I also split that to make two other shapes, the triangle and kite form on the right. I built seven different forms out of these shapes in five different colors. And here's a rendering of the final proposal for the installation. For this project, I was lucky to get the help of the amazing artist and herpetologist Shea Bishop, who I really can't thank enough. We began in the spring of last year by cutting out the forms on the CNC router at Penland. Those forms were then sanded, sealed, and set into these mold boxes. We then poured a liquid urethane rubber over the forms, which, once it sets, you can remove, giving you a rubber mold. Here Shea is casting the pigmented concrete into the molds. We had 14 molds that we cast almost every day for about two months. After the tiles come out of the mold, they need to be cleaned with an acid solution and then sealed. Pretty quickly, every surface of my studio space looked like this. And before long, after a year of only ever seeing this project as a rendering on the computer, the actual installation began and I got to see what it looks like in real life. The facets and the dynamism created by light and shadow were really satisfying to see. Because of the high relief of the tiles and because of the shifting orientation of the facets, liminal is constantly changing depending on the light. This is what the piece looks like around midday when the sun is high and the light is raking across the tiles. At this point, the facets and the cascading shapes that they describe, you can see some star-like shapes, some hexagons, among others. These become the main design feature of the installation during this time of day. In the mid-afternoon, when the sun moves behind the building, the topography drops away, and what is most pronounced are the colors and the footprints of the whole tiles. It turns the grout line into a line drawing and almost erases the high-relief facets completely. This installation is called liminal, which refers to an in-between state of being or knowing. In anthropology, it describes the place in the middle of a rite of passage or ritual, where a person's identity has been shed but not yet reconstituted into something new. Each design element in liminal is shifting. The high relief design, which breaks into smaller and smaller gestures from left to right, the random cascade of colors, the dynamism of the foundational pentagon tessellation, and the play of light and shadow on the faceted forms, which change depending on the position of the sun. 
My hope is that the shifting nature of patterns in this piece suspend the viewer in that in-between space where the need to impose a pre-understood pattern onto our sensory information is frustrated by a design on the move. I'm really grateful to the Center for Craft and to Shea Bishop, Andrew Hayes, Stormy Burns, Ellie Anand, Daniel Beck, and Justin Turcott, who all played an important role in this project. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy, I'm the grant writer. Ecotones are the borders between one kind of habitat and another, like this marsh between a forest and river. Ecotones are rich areas. Organisms from both habitats wander across the edge, and there are other organisms that specialize in the edge habitat itself. My work is an ecotone. For me, it's a rich environment. Sometimes I'm experimenting with art, sometimes with science, sometimes a hybrid of those. For a long time, I was interested in observing fine structures, especially drawing and painting things I saw through a microscope. I started getting more interested in processes than structures. To work with ideas of change, especially evolution and decay, I use series of blind contours. I make a blind contour drawing of an image in nature, then another blind contour of that one, and so on. With blind contour, you only look at the subject and not at your drawing. They're artifacts of pure attention. This one has a blind contour series along the bottom, incorporating an image from a found scientific drawing that is collaged into the piece in the upper center. I got to take my first Penland class last summer, Stitching as Drawing with Susan Brandeis. It gave me a wider vocabulary to work with. I made a science sampler as a way to mess around with different stitching ideas. The sampler on the right plays with a graph from Ian Cousins' lab at Princeton, depicting three different kinds of schooling behavior, swarm, polarized, and milling. I have an obsession with collective animal behavior, flocking, schooling, herding, and so forth. It's in the category of things called emergent processes, which I keep coming back to. I made a few bird charms. This one is scarlet tanager. The satin stitch in the green area is a sonogram of the bird call. The typed text on silk organza is a list of materials the birds use to make the nests. I love reading those lists. They read like poetry. They'll say things like, a tight cup of twigs covered in with lichens, lined with fine grasses, hair, and sometimes caterpillar silk. This one is the cedar waxwing. These bird charms are just trivial, but I like to make a few little things to have around as a lanyap, like for an emergency birthday gift. Last fall, I finally hit a groove to explore and really go deeper. I love maps. Maps take me out of my microscopic myopia. They are big picture. They have wonderful meandering lines. Maps that show change are a way to bring in the ideas of emergence, decay, relationships, processes over time. So I'm starting to use this idea of mapping change as a theme. I'm exploring coastlines and rivers. They're very changeable, and more so now with our warming climate. These are Harold Fisk's maps of historical traces of the Mississippi River produced as part of a report for the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1940s. I find these images humbling. Place is not a fixed thing. It's an event, a very slow event. For this mapping change series, it feels appropriate to work with used linens because they invite me to think about human history, not just natural history. These are going to get other things layered into them, but I don't know what yet. On the left is the headwaters of the Mississippi. I've stepped over where it's just a shallow little creek. On the right is the coastline of Cumberland Island, a wild place, primeval almost, and it contains a lot of my personal history. It makes me deeply sad to think about it eroding away, but it is all the time actually, and now more than ever. I trace that Cumberland Island map off a giant paper map, then I use the window as a light table to trace it into the fabric. My son is moving to St. Louis, so I'm making a pillow cover that has elements of the Missouri River. The linen I use for that is thick and opaque, so it wouldn't work for that window as light table or even for tracing from a bright computer screen. I take tracing paper into larger sections, trace the map, pinned it to the fabric, and cut away areas that were a bit in the way. I stitched onto the fabric and then tore and picked away the bits of paper out from under the stitches. 
I have to say this process wasn't as much fun as using the window as a light table, but I was glad to figure out a way to solve that problem of transferring a map accurately onto opaque fabric. I also really liked typing text onto silk organza and incorporating those sheer words as layers onto my work. Here I'm typing the major tributaries of the Missouri River. I'm not sure why I love this process so much. It's a way to include words and information while also acknowledging that they're just part of this ephemeral, fragile process and that we makers of words are just another thin layer in the geological record. This is a river in the Amazon where the rainforest is burning, the Madre dos Dios. Every scientist who studies natural history is on some level grieving. The extinction crisis, habitat destruction, our hubris at changing the very climate of the planet. There's no word for this scale of grief. I've been struggling with it, not just with the grief itself, but how to even name it. It's so big. Sewing seems like such an inadequate way to address it, but we do sew when we mourn, shrouds, veils, and so forth. I felt I needed to use a really fragile fabric and also something that seemed to contain a lot of memory. I printed out the map of the Madre dos Dios and then I work in a place where light is coming from the back. It's a bit awkward. I've set this one aside partially because it's less fun to work on, but also because, well, it's less fun to work on conceptually too. I think it's part of something larger I'm going to pursue. Change can be something to celebrate too. This one is a wedding present for Cami and Heron, which they're just now finding out about. <laughs> it's a section of the South Toe River. I don't know yet what other elements are going into it. I just put some things on there to start playing around. Thanks for visiting. You can see more of my work at nancylow.studio.